schönen guten Morgen hier auf, äh, zum zweiten Tag der Developer World of der CeBIT. Äh, auch heute haben wir wieder ein gutes Programm mit zehn Vorträgen bis 17.10 Uhr. Ähm, unsere Keynote heute um 12 Uhr wird der .NET-Experte ähm, Holger Schwichtenberg halten. Da geht es dann um den äh, .NET Core 1.0, die neue Implementierung des .NET Frameworks. Ähm, die Vorträge sind immer 30 Minuten, danach gibt es 10 Minuten Pause und die Möglichkeit für Sie Fragen zu stellen. Wenn die Antworten ein bisschen zu lange brauchen, aus Respekt für die nächsten Sprecher verlagern wir das noch ein bisschen außerhalb. Ähm, unsere Sponsoren finden Sie dann da drüben, wenn Sie in den Pausen im Moment Zeit haben und freuen sich über Besuch. Ähm, first talk of today is uh, by um, John Stevenson. <laughs> John Stevenson from Salesforce. We just said. Um, he's very much into uh, cycling and uh, functional programming and he also uh, does a lot of organizing for developer events and is very passionate about uh, community driven uh, development. So uh, his great passion is also closure which is why his talk today will be about just that and let's give a warm welcome to John Stevens. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as you can probably tell, I uh, have not picked up the ability to speak German. I hope that's not too much of a problem. I'm sure your English is far superior to my German anyway, uh, so hopefully you can understand me. If you don't understand me, they just like wave or throw things at me and um, I still won't be able to speak German, but at least I know that you're not understanding what I'm talking about. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Clojure and, and functional programming, mainly about functional programming. I'm using Clojure as an example of some of the concepts in functional programming as well. Uh, so this is me, oh, I'm looking quite dark on the screen, but uh, as you might have guessed by a t-shirt, and here I work for Salesforce, and uh, we're in a galaxy far, far away, uh, which is all the way back to Hall 23, if you want to come and see us and learn about uh, developing on Salesforce. Uh, and if you get lost, you can always uh, like follow me on Twitter and I'll try and give you some directions about how to get back to Hall 23 uh, as well. Uh, and uh, so let's get on with it then. So, uh, who's doing any functional programming whatsoever? Nobody? Completely nothing? Young, eager minds? Excellent, so I can tell you anything and you'll believe me. Um, so, who's doing Java, .NET, OO kind of style programming? A few people. Who doesn't like putting their hand up? Like, there we go, there's loads of people. Um, so, object oriented programming it kind of is a bit like. Uh, this, it goes a bit crazy. Um, you got lots of things running around all the time and lots of things interacting with each other as well. And so when you're trying to do uh, concurrent uh, development, it can be a really, really confusing uh, time to actually keep all these things that are happening in your head all the time. Um, and so the, one of the things about uh, object oriented programming is it's, it's, in, it's trying to break down the state you're, you're doing, but it's still got lots of mutable states. You're still changing things here, there, and everywhere in your program. And if you're not extremely careful, um, then it, it's very easy to change something you don't mean to and affect another part of the, pro, uh, another part of the code you weren't intending to. Um, so it, it can be quite difficult to, to, to manage, but also to reason with as well. And so you get this, this, this idea of a complexity iceberg. So when you actually look at the code, you can look at the, the basics of the code, look at the API and see, okay, well, that looks fairly easy. But when you actually delve into the, the actual workings of the code, there's this whole kind of complexity that you've built into it as well. So one of the things that functional programming is trying to do is trying to avoid this complexity by, again, minimizing state uh, and minimizing the, the side effects that you have. So if this is your, if this is your method, your function, uh, in .NET, so, oops, where's it gone? There we go. Um, so you have, you call that method, that function with some arguments, uh, and you'll get some kind of return value. That's a kind of a good part, because you can see what, what you give to a function, what you give to a method, uh, can, you can kind of work out, you can determine exactly what you will actually get. But if you're pulling things in, if you're pulling things in like an object, you're passing things by reference, those things could actually change while you're actually working upon them, especially if you're working in a concurrent way. And um, the things that you're changing, if you're changing something from the outside world, then um, you're, you're no longer self-contained. You're, you're potentially affecting some other part of the program uh, which other people may or may not know about. 
So it, it's quite tricky. So uh, here is an example of a what we call a pure function. So it's a function that doesn't have side effects. Um, so here we've got a simple function. So in the um, enclosure, we're defining a function by uh, giving it a name. Uh, in this case, implement numbers. Uh, and we're giving it an argument uh, in the square brackets uh, called number collection. And, uh, and then we basically just um, increment all the numbers in that, um, in that collection we're passing. So uh, if we actually call this function with one, two, three, four, five, it's a bit dark. Um, can you probably see that okay? Yeah. Uh, it's, so we're calling one, two, three, four, five, and we basically, uh, in turn, we increment each of these numbers. Uh, well, we're not actually pulling in, any, in anything from the outside world. We're all self-contained. So we know whatever numbers we give them, we can, we can logically reason the output that we're going to get. It's not affected by any other lines of code anywhere else in our program. So we know this code is safe. We can run this it concurrently, and we, we know what it's going to do uh, under all circumstances. Whereas if you have a, a global value that you set, uh, and you're pulling in that global value, something else could set that global value somewhere else. Uh, either just before you've reached, uh, just before you're about to process it. So you think you're processing uh, one, two, three, four, five, but somebody then changes it to five, four, three, two, one, and you're not going to get the result that you actually expect. Uh, so when you when you run it, you'll get. Uh, in this case, we get six, four, uh, six, five, four, three, two, one, <coughs> because we're not actually using this numbers collection that we're passing in. Uh, we're not using this local uh, value, we're actually using a global value instead, and so we get a different result. Uh, and so one of the main things about functional programming is to minimize these side, side effects. Um, and um, so I'm going to show you some more examples of that with Clojure. And Clojure is, has anybody heard of Clojure before? Anybody using Clojure yet? No, not yet. Hopefully after today. Um, <clears throat> so Clojure is a very nice language, functional programming language, derived from, it's a modernization of uh, LISP, uh, which was invented back in 1958. And so it's been, the syntax has been a little bit modified just to, to make it a little bit re more readable. Uh, there's some square brackets and curly brackets as well as round brackets, so it makes it not much nicer to read. Um, and it, the nice thing is it's a hosted language, so it runs on Java, runs on .NET, uh, and you can even generate JavaScript for it as well. So it's, it's quite, uh, uh, quite a flexible uh, deployment uh, uh, options there for Clojure as well. And um, one nice thing is it's got these built-in data structures, which again are all immutable. It means that, so you're not changing state. So in a programming language like .NET or Java, uh, you create a string. You, once you've created that string, you can't actually change that string you have to basically create another string. You might use that initial string to create the new string, uh, but you can't change the original string. It's, it's called an immutable value. Um, so with, um, with the list and the map and the set and the vector in Clojure, these are built-in data structures that allow you to build like a complicated value rather than just a simple kind of single value. Um, and so you can have uh, a list of fish and chips and 42, um, and once you create that list, you can't actually change it. But you, the idea is you run functions over that list, uh, and you get a different result, and it's actually a, a new result in a new list. Uh, so you're not changing the original one. So you've got like a whole history of things. So if somebody else is already, some other part of your code is using uh, this list already, then you're not affecting what they're doing. So again, you can have multiple uh, pieces of code running on the same data without affecting each other. Uh, so uh, a list in round brackets, uh, vectors in square brackets. So we use this for arguments as well, uh, to denote an, an argument of a, pro, uh, of a function. Uh, map is like a hash map, so key value pair. Uh, and a set is just a unique set of values. So those are built in, so data structures. So rather than building your own uh, types, you often use these data structures again to pull in uh, and manage the data you're working with. Clojure is a very data-driven language. Um, so this is pretty much all the syntax you need for this uh, talk. So we've got uh, an empty list, and if you've got a list, the first uh, first element of that list, the first value in that list, is a call to a function, like a call to a method. 
uh, and the, the second part is the uh, the arguments. So it could be a simple uh, value, it could be a string, it could be, could be a collection uh, that you're passing. And you can also define, uh, give things names. So you're just basically assigning a name to a value as well. And uh, you can call functions in a sequence. Uh, so if I call one function using this, uh, this arrow symbol, then it will basically pass the, the result of this first function call, it will pass it to an argument to the second function call, and the second one will pass it to the third one. So that's all the kind of closure syntax I'm going to go into in this talk. So if you kind of understand that, then it should be good. Um, so I mentioned that we've got lists and vectors and maps and sets, and these are called persistent data structures. They're immutable, uh, but if everything in our program was immutable, you couldn't change the state, then it wouldn't be very useful, it wouldn't be able to do anything. So you can have a, a list, or in this case a vector. We've got a vector of uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And when we create that vector, we can't change it. But when we run functions over it, we're actually creating a second and then a third list here. So we create, we do, when we join 5 to the list, we're actually creating a new list. Uh, and then we join six to a list and we create a new list. So instead of one list, we now have three. Um, and if these are really, really uh, big uh, data structures, then you would think that might be quite memory inefficient, but they do memory sharing. So in this case, it's very simple. So the first list has zero to four. So when we create a new list, uh, the new list only has five and then just points back to the other values that it shares with the original list. Uh, and same with six. So we create, um, we create a list initially, and then we just create pointers to that. So we're sharing the memory with the original list, so it's very memory efficient in that way. Uh, so that allows us to use these stateless data structures everywhere without worrying about performance. And so it's the main way you do things with Clojure. Uh, and you can do infinitely long, they're very, very incredibly efficient. And there's some very interesting maths papers about that as well. And one of the nice things about functional programming is you can chain functions together. So you can use a function as uh, an argument to another function. Uh, every time you evaluate a function, um, so if I've got here, I've got range uh, 1 to 10. When I evaluate this function, I'll get a range of numbers, integer numbers, from 1 to 10. And I can actually replace this with the value, and it works exactly the same. And same, same way around. So if I take a value, I can create a function that generates that value. So every function in Clojure generates a value, so you can always use it as an argument to another function. So here we've got uh, reduce, and we're just going to add um, all the numbers from 1 to 10, and we get 45. So it's very easy to uh, construct a, a, a set of functions that work together, that build upon each other, because each of them are generating data uh, that can use as arguments. Uh, so I'm going to skip that example. Uh, we've also got polymorphism as well, so um, you can do, um, here we've got a function called sum, which is going to basically add all the values up. Um, and initially where we can, we've got some polymorph, uh, polymorphism here, so if we call sum with just one argument, it's going to do the first thing, which basically sets this zero uh, value to the uh, accumulating total. So we start off with zero. If we pass, we can pass five here and, and we'll get 47. Uh, but when we call it again, so we're recurring around this and you see that sum is calling itself all the time. And this is a common uh, feature of uh, functional programming is recursion. And um, you can also, if you do really, really big numbers, you use something called tail recursion, which is built into C++ but not into Java. So there's a software version of tail recursion where if we're doing a, a really massive number, like uh, 9.9 9 million, then if we, if we didn't do tail recursion, we'd blow up the heap. But we can do uh, essentially lazily evaluating and, and rewriting over the memory each time. So every time we call sum, we're just rewriting over the memory with the, with, the, um, with the different data we've got. So basically, every time we call recur, we just want the rest of the values, which rest is a function which takes all the values except the first one. So you're basically iterating through all the numbers one by one. Each time you call sum, you're basically making your data set smaller and smaller, but each time uh, updating this 
accumulating total value, so you're tracking uh, the value as you go along. So it's a really nice way to iterate stuff without having to create uh, temporary variables. Uh, and again, because you have, if you have a variable, then you're going to potentially affect what that does. Uh, there's also lazy evaluation as well. So if you, um, uh, if you don't want to kind of have the precision uh, de decided straight up front, there's a built-in data, data type called a ratio. So if I divide 22 by 7, instead of getting 3.14, etc., 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 I actually get 22 over 7. It's actually saving uh, the evaluation until later because I don't necessarily know what value of, say, like, if we assume this is pi, I know it's not quite pi. Um, if we assume that's pi, we, we don't know what the value of pi is we want uh, uh, just yet while we're defining it, but maybe later on we can have, like, different program, different parts of our program gets a different kind of valuation, a different precision by code uh, from, uh, from this value because we're deferring, uh, deciding exactly what the, the, like the decimal point value of this could be. Uh, and same thing with range. Range is a uh, function that will take, will basically just generate an infinite number of integers. Uh, and it's very hard to kind of put infinity inside your computer. So this does this lazily. It only actually evaluates um, uh, the first seven in this case. So we're asking it to just take the first seven results. Instead of generating infinity, it will just generate zero to six for us. So again, it's a nice way to, again, uh, effectively write your code. And so rather than doing a, a for loop with, uh, with the usual kind of uh, uh, stateful uh, variables that you include, again, you can create iterators using the for loop. So again, we're creating a range of 10, and when it's even, um, so we're adding this, uh, basically, this filter to our code, so that every, when it's generating the numbers, it's gonna go through uh, zero, to t zero to nine, and then when it's even, uh, it's gonna print out, uh, it's gonna collect those up into a, a result and print them out at the end. So we get just the even numbers. Or you can use a while uh, clause condition uh, and it will stop when it gets to the first one because it gets to zero and that's even, but one is plus as odd, so then it will stop after just generating uh, the zero. Uh, and you can go crazy as well. So it's a nice way to generate lots of uh, data uh, in, your, uh, in your code as well. Um, and so, okay. yeah, and here's another, here's another example. So um, when, we, when we're creating a local, um, no, not variables, we create a local assignment for a name. So here we've got, um, we've got this let function which basically uh, assigns this, uh, this name uh, to uh, a value. In this case the value is going to be generated by calling this function called uppercase. Uh, so it's going to take uh, uppercase hello world uh, and um, actually convert all those characters to uppercase so that if, if this is in a function we pass the message hello world uh, and then convert it to uppercase here. So we know exactly what it is. We're doing stuff to the, the value we're passing without affecting the outside world. Um, but when we create this, again, this is immutable. It's not going to change once we've created it. And then we're passing it. This is just a simple conversion like to, uh, to Morse code kind of, uh, kind of thing. So if I'm changing a message to Morse code or a, or a binary, version, binary coded version of the message, this is what this function does. And basically, we just split up using map. We just split up the uh, the, uh, the message into its individual characters, and then the characters are then converted into uh, once it, uh, the binary representation of those characters. Uh, and so essentially, we're mapping on it. So we're mapping on onto words this conversion process, but we're not actually changing anything, uh, any state here. Uh, and so it's all, it's all nicely kind of mutable. We don't have to worry about any other parts of our program affecting what's going on. Um, and so this all makes concurrency really, really easy. Uh, if all the things that, that we're doing, all the immutable, uh, all our data structures are immutable, then we don't have to worry about what's actually changing. Uh, and um, it gives us a nice functional isolation, so we can kind of make sure that uh, we can reason about what our program does. And uh, it's very clear, very concise, uh, and often you find that well-written functional programming code is, is very readable. 
uh, and it's one of the nice things. Even if you don't understand the language, it's fairly easy to, to read, assuming it's been written well, of course. Um, and there is also um, something called software transactional memory uh, in Clojure, so you can actually, if you do need to change states, because we do need to change states sometimes, we can do so in a very safe way. Uh, so it's basically like having an atomic database uh, in, or an ACID database inside memory. So if you want to change something, it manages all the locks for you so that no two things can change states at the same time. Uh, so it's really nice. It's, it's like doing, it's like imagine, uh, so like with Java and with .NET, uh, it, it manages all the garbage collection for you so you don't have to manage all the memory. This is the same thing but for changing state as well. And we, we do that with the, 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 the atom function. So we define something as an atom. Here we're just defining an empty uh, vector. Or we can define it with a validation. So we're defining something called players. We want to create a card game. And uh, we're going to have players. And we can decide, well, we can only have two players at once. So we put a, a validation function on there to make sure that uh, there's no more than two players at once. And then we can, um, we can join the players to that. Uh, and so as we're joining players, we're basically using this swap function to say, I want to update that value, I want to actually change the memory, uh, the value in that memory location, rather than being stateful. Uh, and I can reset it as well. So it's a nice distinction about when you're actually changing state. Uh, so you specifically have to use things like reset and swap to actually specifically, explicitly change the state of things. So everything else you're doing is immutable, so again, you can, again, very clearly reason about what your code does. Uh, and here we've got um, a, a more complete example here where also uh, we're adding uh, names, but we're also updating their accounts. So when we're adding a player, we give them 100 euros. So they'll go and spend uh, 100 euros and then hopefully spend even more money and we'll make a huge profit and we'll all be rich. I think that's how the, uh, these online gambling systems work. And so we very easily add Harriet to uh, um, uh, Harriet and her account, uh, and then we can also pass the, the game account. So when we give Harriet uh, 100 euros, then we um, decrement our uh, game account by 100 euros. So we know exactly how much we've spent, how much we've earned, tracking the code. So you can do uh, uh, you can manage like an atomic transaction very, very easily, and it's all managed, it either happens or it doesn't, and this all happens in code, just like you would do if you were updating a database. Um, so I'm gonna do a little example here, assuming I've got time, oh yes. Um, so I'm going to, um, not that one, I'll do a few examples, where is it? Let's find the right example, uh, oops. So here I've got some code. Um, basically what I'm doing is pulling in a book. Uh, this is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you haven't read it, it's a really good read. And I'm just going to evaluate that book. So I basically, all I'm just doing is pulling in the text of the book. There's like one long big string. And uh, I can also do the same thing with some English words. So this is code I've written. I'm, I'm running a I've got a runtime environment behind this editor, so it's a live closure environment that's running. So all I'm doing is just getting it to evaluate this code. So in the background, it's, uh, it's compiling the code and injecting it into the runtime environment so that it's live and running code, and I can test it and I can get results from it straight away. So if I, um, here I've got my, um, it's called a threading macro, uh, and basically it says, it basically allows you to write uh, your code a little bit more sequentially, even though it's still functional programming. Um, so here I'm just going to get it to evaluate book. So what is the value of book? All these other lines uh, with the hashes uh, comments copied out at the moment. And I'm going to uncomment them out in some kind of order. So if I do, uh, if I evaluate this, uh, I get I get the text of the book, um, which is nice. Uh, which is good, but I want to find out what's the most uh, what's the most commonly used word in the book, uh, and because um, I'm just like that. And so I'm going to base I'm going to take the book, uh, which is one long piece of text, and I'm going to use uh, 
just uh, some regular expression stuff, just to break it down into uh, a um, into a set of strings. Uh, oops, I pressed the wrong button. There. There we go. So now, uh, instead of one long string, it's a whole series of strings. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. Um, so this is a whole bunch of strings in a, in a list. Uh, so this is the whole book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I want to work out what the frequencies are. So there's a very nice function in enclosure called frequencies. Uh, so I can run that as well. So I'm just evaluating uh, the results of this each time. And, uh, and, and so now, it, next to each word, there's a, there's a value, how often it occurs. But they're not actually in order, so I don't know which is the, which is the most one. Million is there 26 times. Uh, so I can sort by the value. So this is essentially, this is, kind of, this is, a, this is a map. So I've got a key and a value. The key is just a string in this case, and the value is uh, a numeric value. So I'm going to sort by, by these values. Uh, so it should nice, be nicely in order. So I'm just going to evaluate it again, uh, and now it's put it into um, a, a series of a list of vectors. So I've got uh, the, the, the words and how often they appear. So these are all these are all one, 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 one. So I can scroll all the way through the book and try and find the biggest one. But uh, there's a quick way to do that. I'll just reverse the whole uh, output of what I'm generating. So each time I'm oh, ooh, what did I do? Uh, I broke it. No, oh, demo fail, that's not good. Uh, that's not good at all. Oh, yeah. uh, it worked before. Uh, I must have done something wrong. Uh, let's see. Oh, we go. So now I've got uh, all the words, and strangely enough, the most common word is there. That's not very useful. I want, so I'm going to now strip out all the common words. And uh, I'll do that there. Uh, and because I've got this, I've got this common words uh, set of words. I'm just basically excluding from the results. Uh, and I'm almost there because I've got um, the most common word is I, um, which is supposed to be in the common words. But I've noticed that it's actually it's I uppercase. So let's uh, let's do something uh, to change. Everything down to lowercase so it will all match properly. And then when I do the final thing there, uh, yeah, there we go. I now get um, I now get Arthur, which is one of the main characters of the book. Surprisingly, Arthur is the most common word in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that isn't an English common word. Um, and all this time, I'm kind of processing the book all the time, but I'm not actually changing it. I'm just basically working on it and getting a result back from it. So it's all nicely mutable. I'm not changing state in any of these functions whatsoever, and they're just passing the results over to each other, so nicely chained together. But you can do all sorts of things uh, with Clojure as well. You can also do, um, um, you can also play games as well. You can also create um, sort of interactive games. You can do reactive programming as well. Um, so here I've got uh, Flappy Birds, which, um, which I'm cheating because I've turned off uh, the collection detection on this. Uh, but if I go back to my code and um, uh, find the uh, find the right buffer, then uh, and uh, I go and find um, there we go. Uh, and there's my little cheat. So if I go and comment that and save it, uh, now when I Go back to my thing. I've crashed. I, I, I now have to play Flappy Birds properly, of which I'm, I'm not very good at. No, it's it. They go I'm terrible. So you can do some really, really interactive development with Clojure as well. It's a really fast kind of feedback cycle uh, about what you're doing, and um, it is really good fun. So there's a whole bunch of um, uh, references. These all slides are on uh, SlideShare, so I'm not going to go through these very quickly. But there's a whole bunch of IDEs you can use with Clojure as well, uh, and a really nice build tool. Um, and uh, you don't have to use Emacs, but I just, I'm an Emacs fan. Uh, and you do some amazing things like build your own games, which are really cool. Um, and there's tons of books on Clojure as well. Uh, and there's lots of help online. We've got our own set of libraries as well. And um, I've done some books and there's some stuff here as well. It's all online. I've tweeted it out. If you follow me on JRocket, you'll be able to find it. 
uh, concerts are just about to run out of time. Uh, but feel free to uh, come see us in Hall 23 and find out more about Closure or even Salesforce as well. Uh, and thanks very much for your time. Thank you.